Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. That was a good, loud good morning. Kent Madigan is my name. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, grateful to be here with you this morning. This morning, uh, we are going to continue our series in Deuteronomy uh, with a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we'll be in verses 11 through 20. But just to get you up to speed, what we have here in the book of Deuteronomy are the children of Israel about to enter the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the desert. And now the time has come and they're about to enter and conquer the land and take possession of it as they were promised. But before they go in, Moses, their leader, who sadly for him isn't going with them, has some things that God wants him to say to the children of Israel as a reminder to this bunch of wanderers before they take the land. It's really like a dad sending his children off to college in a faraway place, and while there's a lot of excitement, there's also danger, and he wants to warn them of the many dangers that are out there. And this passage is really just that. It's, it's another warning in the midst of incredible excitement to the people of Israel from their leader about what they need to be aware of as they enter the land. So let me read the text and we'll pray and then we'll get right to work. Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 20 says this, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for today, and I thank you for your word that speaks truth to us. The warnings of Scripture that you have given thousands of years ago are as relevant today as if you wrote them this afternoon. Father, I... I pray that as your people here this morning, we would hear from you today and that we would heed your warning and that we would follow you boldly um, and that we would not live lives actually wasting our life when you're calling us into so much more. Father, as, a, as a, just a, a man, I am again incapable of bringing you um, glory through your word and through the words today and I'm incapable of uh, speaking a message that is uh, worth listening to, but I pray that by your Spirit you would move in us and that you would move in my heart and my mind through my mouth to these your people and impact us all, that, that we would ultimately see you in these next few moments and give you glory and give you praise and give you honor and, uh, and use our lives to do the very same. So Father, we give you all glory and all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here's the key to the text this morning, what Moses is saying and warning the people of in a nutshell. It's kind of a good news, bad news thing, really. Uh, the good news is, as he says to the people, and this would be a wonderful thing to hear, I think, 
He says, you're going to be blessed in this land. This is a promised land. All that you've been waiting for, it's, it's going to be there. It's, it's going to be great. You'll have houses and food, silver and gold, herds and flocks, and it's going to grow and multiply. It's going to be very, very, very good for you in the land. The bad news is, when that happens, you're going to forget where it came from. You're going to forget how you got there, or at least you're going to be at risk of forgetting how you got there. You're going to be tempted to forget where your blessings came from. It will be easy for you, sadly, to forget God. Now, this is similar to what we covered last week when we talked about idols. Uh, They were going in, they were going to win, but when they won, they were going to forget the God who brought them there, and they were going to go off chasing other gods, idols. But what I think Moses does here as he moves through uh, chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and into 8, is I think he's digging a little bit deeper. He's warning the children again a a little bit more, trying to make it more clear of, of just how at risk you are under blessing. He's digging a little deeper in to expose a particular idol and maybe the idol that drives all the other idols. An idol that is so common, so welcome, that apart from Moses drilling down on it, it might be very hard to see. He's saying, look, you're going to win, and and you're going to be prosperous, and you're going to be blessed. That is all going to happen. That's a guarantee. But when that happens, you'll be at risk of elevating something else higher than God himself. When all your worldly needs are met, you will get comfortable. And you will become so comfortable that comfort will become your God if you're not careful. And if you think about it, That's what happens, isn't it? When things are going well, when life is good, we as people are prone to get comfortable. For most of us here, we we have our material needs met, and if we didn't compare ourselves to anybody else, we would feel blessed. If you just took a look at what you actually had, you didn't compare to what everybody else had, you would feel like you had a lot. Most of us here have a roof over our head and food and clothes, and I realize not everyone in the city may have that, but probably most of us in the room do. And we're a blessed people, and sometimes a comfortable people. And when things are good, we have a tendency to forget God in the midst of how good things are. I had a friend move from South Africa to, to Canada, to Rosalind, And she was remarking and kind of lamenting how she actually prayed a lot less since she moved. And the reason was, in South Africa, she was afraid. When she went to get groceries or she went to the bank, she prayed for God's safety and God's covering and God's blessing because there was this discomfort that went along with her life because of the dangers that surrounded her in South Africa, where she was. But in Canada, she didn't feel like that. She didn't feel like it was dangerous to go to the grocery store or to go to the bank or to go get your kids from school. And she said, and I've noticed that I haven't prayed near as much. Comfortable. I've heard it countless times how people who've been blessed by God forget God in the good times. We've heard those testimonies, I'm sure, before over and over. The simple fact is, when you listen to their stories, they they had the material blessing and they just got comfortable. Oh, when things are hard and times are tough, people are calling out to God. They're they're leaning in and they're wanting to know Him and they're wanting Him to save them. But when things get good again, they get comfortable and they forget God and they go back to life. The truth is, when the people of Israel were blessed 
As you read of their story throughout the Old Testament, they tended to fumble the ball in their relationship with God because they just got comfortable with all that God had given them. And the truth is, we are prone to doing the exact same thing. And so the warning this morning is don't stop being obedient to God. Don't stop following God. Don't forget God when He's been so good to you. Don't be so comfortable in your blessings that you forget where the blessings come from. And this is tricky because just like the rest of idol identification, identifying the idol of comfort is hard. So what does it look like when we get too comfortable in God's blessing? What are some of the things that could happen? What are some of the ways that could have happened to the children of Israel? But what are some of the ways that it might look for us if we aren't paying attention to our lives when our physical and material needs are being provided for? And when it no longer feels that we have this urgent desperation for God, what does it look like? Well, I think it can have a few different looks. I think it can start by simply looking like you've lost the joy of your salvation. Remember David in his psalm, restoring to me the joy of my salvation? He lost the joy, and when, uh, when we get comfortable, that can happen to us because we see that it's all provided for. And you were once alive in your newfound relationship with Christ, and you enjoyed it. You found pleasure in following the way of Jesus. You opened your Bible with anticipation. You looked forward to your time in prayer. You had new friends in the church. Maybe you even came to faith like I I heard of another fellow this week in one of those times where he was literally in a a death sort of situation and, and he was crying out to God, God, if you save me, I'll follow you for the rest of my life. And God did. And maybe that's how God saved you, and, and, and you were serving him until you weren't. Because life got good again, and you feel untouchable again, and you're comfortable again. And like a kid testing the waters to see how far they can go, you, you venture bit by bit wandering from God. All of a sudden, you just start to take a pass on the gathering. You just don't make being together like we're together today a priority, even though the Scripture calls us to it. You become more willing to justify things you know aren't right. You start to laugh at the off-color jokes in the office. You start to use a little crude language to fit in a little better, to be a little more comfortable in your surroundings. You don't tell the whole truth anymore. As Jamie said, you use alternative facts. He stole my joke, two of them, today before I got up here. It's okay, though, buddy. It's all good. They were funny. But you start to slide a little bit this way, and it doesn't seem to hurt. You still have your health. You still have your job. You still have your house, your car, your vacation. You're still comfortable. But your need for Jesus, or the way you perceive your need for Jesus, is a little less. Your trust in Him is weakened. Your love for Him is softened. And you start to think more about you and what makes you happy and makes you comfortable. You think it's you now who is providing the safety and the security that you can rescue you from any situation. And you're drifting from God, and the joy that you first had in Him is starting to fade because you're just comfortable. It's the beginning of what we call backsliding. (laughs) Just little steps away because your comfort matters more than your relationship to God does. And you're starting to become okay with it. That's the first way we start to become disobedient in our comfortable blessings. The second way comfort erodes our obedience is when it goes beyond slipping, beyond backsliding to the place where people are just gone. 
And I won't spend too much time on this except to warn us, because for the people I'm talking about, they aren't here to hear this message most likely. But if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've seen it. They used to be here. They had an experience with God. They might have even grown up in a Christian home, yet somehow their idea of God was limited to nothing more than just a genie in a bottle that you call on for your wishes. And they don't want Him in the day-to-day. They just want Him to make them comfortable again. To this day, even though they're, they're not here and they're not doing whatever they're doing, they, they probably even call themselves Christians, if you were to ask them. But if you were to go deeper, you would discover that they don't even really know what that means anymore. Because their functional understanding of who God is, is that He's there to serve them. So they do whatever they want while paying lip service to their faith. And they are sadly gone. And the truth is, if you remain so comfortable in your sin that you're willing to start to take steps away from Him, it won't be long and you'll be gone too. That's how comfort works. And all those are ways you might expect for the idol of comfort to play out in our lives. The way Moses was anticipating it would go for the children of Israel if they weren't careful. It's something we've seen or experienced. It, it isn't just for ancient people. But I think if we mine down a little more, there's, there's something else that comfort makes us susceptible to when it comes to disobedience to God in the midst of a blessing. Here's another thought. As if we weren't uncomfortable enough. As much as we feel that even in times of blessing, even in times of prosperity, that we aren't falling away, we aren't doing bad things, we don't use alternative facts, we don't say things we shouldn't, we follow the rules, we aren't willfully disobedient, and hey, you're obviously here, so that's a good sign. But I wonder if comfort in life leads us to disobedience in a different way. Maybe comfort hasn't led us to commit sin, but maybe a love of comfort has stopped us from doing what we know we should. Maybe comfort has become the governor on how far we will go to do that which we know God is calling us to. And instead of doing something we know we shouldn't, a sin of commission, we don't do what he is asking us to and we sin by omission. Let me illustrate. This past week, I went and had lunch with someone at the IHOP and it was awesome. Not just the food, but the company especially. And on the way out of the restaurant, there was a car parked beside my truck and then a car on the other side of that. And I was getting in my truck when the guy from the car on the other side called out to me asking if I knew anything about vehicles because the one in between us was having trouble, wouldn't go into gear, was kind of stuck. Now the truth is, I don't know anything about vehicles. I am no mechanic by any means. So I answered him the truth. I said, I know nothing. However, another thought came to me. Because just before Christmas, our dishwasher went on the blink and wouldn't drain properly. And I was trying in vain to fix it with the help of Google. (laughs) Because that's cheap. But then my beautiful wife, Danette, just prayed for the dishwasher. And honestly, I thought I'd still be phoning someone later. But lo and behold, the dishwasher has never worked so well. I kid you not. It is the best that thing has ever worked. Only God. So the thought I had come to mind was, man, you should pray for this person's car. You should just get out of your truck and pray for this person's car. But the next thought that came to mind was, no, that'd be weird. (laughs) And so... I wished him well, got in my truck, and drove away, because that was comfortable. 
The sad part for me, though, is this. I know better. I know God sometimes asks us to do seemingly weird things out of our comfort zone, all for his glory. I actually know his voice. And in that split-second decision, I still said no. That's what I mean by a sin of omission. And I'm guilty, and I've had to repent for that. But how many times are we called into something awesome, and we don't go? Because it makes us uncomfortable. How many times are we called to love our neighbor, but we just don't? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Or how many times have you felt the need to share your faith or pray for someone or invite them in, but you don't because it's just uncomfortable? And think of how much easier it has become to pacify ourselves by supporting someone else, an organization who's doing a good work of loving your neighbor versus actually crossing the lawn, the room, or the parking lot to participate in the work God has called you to as an individual follower of Jesus. It's become real easy just to, to give money and, and to put stuff online and, and to join along with Facebook chats and all kinds of stuff like that. It's been real easy as though we're, we're really playing out our Christian faith by doing this. And not all of it's wrong. We, we shouldn't stop that. But lately I've been wondering if we could better affect social change by just radically following Jesus in his command to love God and love others, every single one of us in this room. What would happen if instead of only looking to support a big organization, we also were radically committed to the small acts of love that take place between yourself and another actual human being when the Spirit of God prompts you in such a way? I wonder what would happen in our city in 15 years regarding the hungry and homeless, if every one of us in this room were willing to commit to answering that still, small voice every time you heard it whisper. I wonder what at-risk kids would find an alternate home. I wonder what youth, who might have nowhere else to turn, would find a welcome table for family conversations that would keep them from the path they would have otherwise gone on because you just loved your neighbor as yourself. I wonder who it is that God is tapping on our shoulders that are, are 10 and 12 and 15 years old today that in 15 years' time will be going down a very different path unless you answer the still small voice to invite them in and love them like your own. Radical love, small ways, I believe would produce massive change. I wonder if it would even be bigger than that. I wonder if things like, like abortion rates, and we've seen the, the March for Women and, and all of this kind of controversy going on, and I, I, am, I am against abortion. I'm not for that in any way. But I wonder how in, instead of marching all the time or supporting places that march, if we just loved the people that were going in and made ourselves more available to those types of places, I wonder if we were just a little more on the front line, loving people through whatever decision that they make, if in, in time we wouldn't actually see those rates drop because of radical love from individuals who are being the church because they won't be so comfortable to sit in a pew and be content with just hanging back. I wonder if radical love over an amount of time would radically shift our culture. You know what, church? I believe it would. I know it would. And I wonder what we miss when we don't listen for God's voice or we're unwilling to obey because it makes us squirm a little. I wonder what would have happened if I'd have prayed over that car. Do you see what I mean about being so comfortable, but about idolizing comfort so much that we almost become paralyzed by it? Has that ever happened to you? That's what the idol of comfort can do to us. And I'll tell you this, the scripture isn't kidding when it's leading you to perish. It's destroying you. It's, 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 you're missing out on the life God has called you to. 
And it's probable that many of us have found ourselves in disobedience to God because we want to maintain our comfort. So it isn't too far-fetched to think the children of Israel would have the same problem. But if you think about it, why does God bless us in the first place? I mean, why did he bless the children of Israel? What was behind that? He knew he was going to do it. He knew they were going to uh, struggle under the kind of blessing. Uh, to, they were going to struggle to keep him in the forefront of their thoughts and affections. So why not just keep them desperate for him like they were in the wilderness? You know, in the wilderness, they didn't have lots, but all they had was from the hand of God. They had manna from heaven. It was probably gluten-free, so everyone could eat it. And their clothes and shoes never wore out, so same shoes for 40 years, which contrary to what some of you think is actually good. And they saw God's hand as he parted seas and rivers and fed them and watered them and protected them. So why bless them more than that? That actually sounds pretty good. But look at verse 18 in the text. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm, confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God blessed them more. He gave them the land. He brought them into all of that abundance because God made a deal with Abram way back in Genesis 12 when God called Abram out of his comfortable, settled life. God said, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that, so that, here's the reason he gave them the blessing, so that you will be a blessing. They were going to be blessed. They were going to inherit all of this and see it multiply greatly in order that they would be a blessing. They weren't just being blessed to have comfortable little lives. God was setting apart his own people so they would be a blessing to the world. And so it is with us. You are blessed by God to be a blessing to others. Now think about what that means. It means you're not your own, that you were bought with a price. It means that every good thing that comes through your hands is given to you by God himself and is to be used for his glory alone. Now, you might think that sounds like kind of a downer, right? Because your blessing comes with responsibility to be a blessing. But think of the increased blessing that it is to be a blessing. We just came through Christmas a month ago and everyone was saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we mean that. One of the wonderful gifts we try to give at Christmas is to enable families who can't give gifts to their children on their own that opportunity through the Christmas Bureau. And there's something that warms our heart about that, that a parent could come in and be a blessing to their children. We feel blessed to be a blessing. There is incredible blessing in being a blessing. And here's crazy. I believe in many ways, big and small, God is calling us out to be a blessing, which would actually increase your blessing if you would just move through the discomfort of it all. But we miss it because we're too comfortable and we've mistakenly thought that this is all there is. The even crazier part about this is we know it. I don't think anything I'm saying here is new. We love to be a blessing, and we hate to be a burden. But still, we get stuck loving comfort more than we love God and are content with this amount of blessing when if we would just move, we would be blessed even more to be a blessing. He has blessed you. He is calling you. Will you answer? The king of the universe has invited you into his family to be a blessing to those around you. The people that you run into in the store and at the gas station, at the post office, the people that you bump into on the street, whether you've met them before or not, God is calling you to be a blessing and he will tap you on the shoulder and whisper in your ear, will you answer the call, even though it seems really, really weird. There may already be someone in your mind 
that you've been too comfortable to talk to, too comfortable to show that kind of radical love to. So will you love them? Will you overcome the obstacles of comfort to join God in what he's doing because it's a blessing to be a blessing? And you know what? Sitting here in this pretty comfortable auditorium, unless you got a seat with a spring sticking up, in which case move, there's seats. But here, when I say that, I know you want to. I'm pretty sure you want to. Pretty sure sitting here, there's somebody you're thinking, you go, you know what, God, I would like to move out of that discomfort because I know there's more of you and more for me in this with you as I go. If I just get a little uncomfortable. I, I believe that sitting here, there's good-hearted people that want to move. But I also know it isn't that easy. I've preached enough sermons to know that when we're sitting here, thinking about how we know we are to do, what we know we are to do, what we really want to do. We're motivated. Sitting here, it's like, yeah, I could do that. I, I want to be part of what God's doing. I want to be part of bigger change. And, and I believe God is calling me into more. And I don't want to be doing nothing except attending services. And when we're here, we're motivated. And provides this happens before we go out for lunch, we're all in. But the truth is, overcoming the idolatry of comfort and complacency that can accompany blessing isn't that easy. It won't be that easy this afternoon when we're thinking about doing it tomorrow. And it won't be that easy tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that until this sermon is completely gone from your mind. So what do we do? And the answer is in the passage. Five times in the passage, the people of Israel are reminded of the Lord your God. Don't forget the Lord your God. Don't forget the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. And I think what's a a real critical word in that that we can easily overlook is the word your. Your God. The Lord your God. Have you ever thought of how intimate that is? There's just so much relationship there. Don't forget the Lord, your God. Because that isn't to be understood like you are in possession of him, like you are in possession of your vehicle, that you can do whatever you want with it because it's yours. No, there's, there's a relationship to this. He is your God and you are his children. When I say to my kids, I'm your dad and, they, and you are my kids, It's highly relational. I have them and they have me and there's warmth and tenderness and affection there. There's this mutual, reciprocal, understanding, relational, tender affection. He says, I'm the Lord, your God. And the key is to not forget him. You know, last week I did my best to remind you of who God is and I spent two and a half straight minutes trying to remind you of who he is. And I went through it very fast. My daughter said I should be a rapper. I don't know if I could pull that whole hip-hop thing off. And I, but I, I tried to describe to you who, who Christ is and how meaningful he is to you. But one thing I didn't say, which is also true about the Lord, your God, is he is your father. If you are in Christ, you are his child, and he is your father. And he is a good father. And because he is a good father, he calls you out of your comfort and into fuller and fuller life. He is even calling you into discomfort with him to enjoy the blessing of being a blessing if you will just follow him into that adventure. I was thinking about this in light of children. And this story has to do with an uncle and his niece. But the point is still the same. The summer we were at Cultus Lake Water Park and my seven-year-old niece very much wanted to get off the kiddie slides and onto the bigger slides with her older cousins. The problem was she was terrified. So she would go up and wait in line and then get to her turn and then turn around crying and come down the stairs. And she did this for a while and then I offered. I said, you know what, I'll take you up and try to, try to get you to go down the slide. So we went up, we're at the top, I gave her my best pep talks, we prayed together at the top of the slide, everything was going to be okay, we did a demonstration, 
everything. Sure, it would be safe. Tried to talk her through it. And then we got to the place, and she was like, nope, crying. And so I said, okay, well, we'll just let the next person go. And then when you're ready again, we'll take another stab at it. And so then we let the next person go, and we'd wait, and the next person go, and we'd wait, and the next person go, and we'd wait. And we did that for 45 minutes. <laughs> Until she finally gave up, and we walked down together. Now, if she would have trusted me, she would have moved from the kitty slides through her discomfort to a much greater place. If she would have truly believed that I would never let her do anything that would hurt her, she would have moved through her discomfort to more fun. Now, truthfully, I thought about pushing her down by force to make her have fun, so her skepticism was kind of warranted. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But that's not our father. Our father is a good father. And you need to know this. Your father loves you. He absolutely adores you. He doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to call you into more and more and more life in obedience to him. And he is fully trustworthy. And if we will follow him from the life we have through our discomfort to even greater blessing, we will reap incredible rewards as our lives are used to be a blessing. And we would see this world become radically different if the church would just move in that direction. But you will never move from comfort to obedience at any level until you remember who your father is and that he is good and that he loves you. And once you recognize that, once you remember his love, following him in obedience in the early stages of disobedience, when you're watching your mouth or careful about what you laugh at or, or, or when you've backslidden completely or when, you, when you're just afraid to take a risk, when you remember who your father is and that he loves you, it's a joy to willingly follow him because it's better. There's life there. Especially when you remember how he became the Lord, your God, your father in the first place. You weren't born into his family. He sent his son Jesus Christ out of the comforts of heaven to earth and then even out of the comforts of earth to the cross to die in your place and rise again to welcome you into the family of God. He is your Father, and He loves you. When you see that, you can cast off your comfort and follow Him into the fullness of life, because at that moment, obedience won't seem like a heavy. It will seem like an adventure with your dad who is with you every step of the way. It may make you uncomfortable in the moment, but it's leading to your ultimate joy in Him. And one more thing. If you have a day when you don't slide down the slide, our Father will take you, forgive you, and he will take you to the park again. Because before the week was out, God gave me another chance to follow his leading, his prompting, his still small voice. And this time I didn't miss it. And it was beautiful. And he will do the same for you. Your time is now. Your moment is now. God has not stopped speaking to you and calling you into greater things in this life. He's blessed you to be a blessing. So follow him in it because he loves you. Remember your father in your blessing and keep following him into the adventure of a lifetime. Worship team, why don't you come up and we'll pray. Father, thank you that you are our father and you are a good father. We, we worship you, we adore you, we love you, and we want to follow you in a life because you, you didn't just save us for some day, for eternity. You saved us for an abundant life today. But that will require us many times to just get uncomfortable. But in our discomfort, we get to walk with you and walk through these things with you. So help us to fix our eyes on you and never forget what you've called us to in this life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.